Well, good morning, everybody. My name is George Gray, pastor here at River of Life Fellowship Church, and I am doing what every pastor wants to do on a Monday morning. I am re-recording yesterday's sermon. Um, that way I can filter out all the heresies and things like that that I put in, you know, on normal Sundays. Uh, no, we had a little audio issue yesterday. No big deal. We're doing some upgrades with our technology. So uh, this is it kind of expected, but it just sort of is what it is. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to re-record this because the audio, unfortunately, from yesterday was was pretty bad. Um, if you watched it online... Uh, I apologize. We are doing um, some work on our system and doing some technology upgrades, so hopefully these things will work themselves out shortly. So, but with that being said, let's move forward with today. Um, so, the the message that I did yesterday was titled "Stepping Up and Standing Firm," and the idea was uh, it was it was based around a conference we had the weekend before, where we uh, we hosted Striving for Eternity Ministries with uh, Andrew Rappaport and Aaron Brewster. Really great weekend. Seven sessions was fantastic. If you have not seen it, check it out on the YouTube page because it was really, really good. Um, I'll have the links in the bottom of this uh, this particular uh, uh, video. So, so what we did, um, uh, I did something I don't normally do. Uh, I brought someone up that I knew was going to have some views that are not um, generally uh, uh, accepted by people in our area and even people in our own church. And there are some views that they hold to that I don't necessarily agree with. And so I get asked the question, you know, gosh, why would you, why, why would you do that? Um, and the idea is uh, that we agreed on all the right things. We we line we align with all the right things. Other stuff is just it, it, it's, it's trivia. It's things we can have a nice conversation with, and then we can agree to disagree and move on with our life and lead people to Christ. That's the whole idea, you know. A hundred percent unity in all things is not necessary, and being challenged by by different views is a healthy thing for Christians to do. We should we should not be running away from ideas that are not necessarily universally in agreement with everything that we believe. If you find yourself um surrounding yourself with people who only believe everything that you do, that's I'll say this nicely, that is a sign of a weak person where where you have to be agreed with, you have to be, you know, uh, uh, everything's got to be right on your side. That That is not a strong position and that's not a strong place in order to develop your faith. Allow yourself to be challenged and uh, we'll walk through and I'll kind of give you an idea why because at, at some point you have to be able to defend your faith and if you can't, if you cannot defend your position, then the question is what do you, do you, uh, uh, do you really have that position or is it just something you were just fed and you have never actually challenged that particular view? Do you, do you know why you believe what you believe? So we're kind of looking at this. So, um, so, and I met Andrew a number of years ago at Answers in Genesis, uh, at a pastor's conference down there. Um, I was talking with him and Justin Peters and, uh, uh, who are just great guys, great guys. We tried to get Justin up this year, but it just, timing wise, it just didn't work. Um, but, uh, but Andrew was able to come up. It was a wonderful weekend. And uh, like I said, you should really check the videos out. It was great. But like with any conference, and I mean any conference, um, you're going to hear there, – there's three things that are basically going to happen. You're going to hear things that you absolutely agree with. And th- that's so good um, because you are encouraged – you know, you, you, you get, you gain in confidence, you know, you know that you're not alone in, in your beliefs. And so you have, you know, people that you can, that you can walk with that, that hold similar views or the exact same view. Uh, for those of you just listening to the audio, that was me drinking coffee. So, uh, I, I would apologize, but it's, you know, eight o'clock and it's coffee. So, you know, that's just the way it works. So, um, so you find people that you absolutely agree with, but you're going to hear things that you don't necessarily agree with. You don't vehemently disagree with it either, but you're just like, you know what, I don't know if I totally agree with that that entire view. Okay, that's great. And then you're going to find things that you absolutely universally disagree with. Um, and that's that's okay as well, as long as you understand why you disagree with it. Um, so there are two questions that we need to be asking ourselves when we find ourselves in those situations. The first one is, do I know why I, do I know why I disagree or do I just disagree? Um, one of the things that I was, uh, I would ran into a lot, uh, growing up in the church, uh, not growing up in the church, growing in my faith. I didn't become a Christian until I was 20 years old. So I did not grow up in the church, believe me. Um, uh, so <laughs> a lot of my, a lot of my old time friends can, can vouch for that. I did not grow up in the church. Um, so, but when we when we run into something that we don't necessarily that we just absolutely disagree with, do we know why we disagree with it? And what I would run into a lot is that um, I would hear something and I'd be like, "No, that can't be true." And my reasoning for why it just can't be true is because um, at the time my pastor didn't teach that. 
you know, we, we don't, I don't, I, I don't agree with that. Cause if that was right, my pastor would, 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 uh, uh would, would tell me. And, uh, uh, so the question is, 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 is that actually accurate? Uh, and of course the answer is no, uh, it's that, that's not the way it goes. Um, uh, I think I can't remember who said it. It actually may it might have been either John MacArthur or Spurgeon um, said that you know none none of us as ministers are more than about seventy percent correct. The rest of it are are our views on things. You know, so there's always going to be places where we hold to a view, um, but it, we don't we can't say universally this is absolutely true and God would back me up. There there are going to be things that there are conclusions that we come to. Because of our presuppositions, and we cannot say with with any with one hundred percent honesty, this is universally true for all people in all times. There are views, and our thinking brought us to those views. So, but do we know why we disagree, or do we just disagree because we heard something different and we liked the different way better? So, we need to do a little work here. And the second thing we need to to, to ask ourselves is: Do I know enough about my own position to explain clearly? Why I disagree. So those two questions come together, obviously, quite quickly. Um, cause there's a lot of people, especially on the charismatic side, which is me, by the way, um, that, uh, there's a lot of people on, on what I would say our side of the fence that, um, hold to certain views and they have no ability to explain why they hold to those views at all. Their favorite speaker at some point in time said that they had this view and this is what we should believe and they just believed it because their favorite speaker is the one that uh, is, is backing it up. So they're just totally into it, but they don't really have a good reason to be into it, which is a sad reality, but that is a reality. So here's an uh, all too common mistake that we make when we are disagreeing. We disagree because we disagree. You know, we don't like the way something sounds. We don't like the way it feels. Um, it conflicts with my own d- decision making. We see that a lot today. You think of some of the big splits going on in the, in today, uh, over, uh, LGBTQ doctrine and things like that. And people get all bent out of shape because how can a Christian talking about, you know, serving a loving God say that this is sin? Because, because it is. You know, that because the Bible says so. So we end up with these, with these conflicts. We end up with these, with these areas that people disagree with because they want something else. They, they, they want God to be on their side when in reality, the whole idea is for us to get on God's side. That's, that's the, the challenge and to do so with, you know, degree of kindness. So, so maybe it just conflicts with something that we want to be true, but doesn't necessarily, just because we want it doesn't mean it's true. The other thing is it might actually expose some of our own, our own ignorance. There's plenty of people who talk about the Bible that, um, uh, want, they make claims about the Bible that are just absolutely untrue. And, and they're untrue to the point of absolute ignorance. Uh, you know, if you've ever watched the ladies on the view try to, try to talk about anything in, re- in regards to sin in the Bible and, and, uh, the understanding of the character and nature of God, they always get it wrong. It's just, uni- just, just universally, they're just always wrong because they want God to be on their side, but what they find out is they don't even know who God is. And so it's, it just exposed their own ignorance, um, which is which is sad. But sometimes, when when we get confronted with a challenging idea, it might actually expose the fact that we don't know what we are claiming to know. And so we we so on that side, we have work to do. Right. The last thing we want to do is fill in the blanks of someone's uh, viewpoint with our own assumptions. Um, and uh, that leads me to the last one. Uh, maybe we don't actually understand what the person that we're listening to, we might not actually understand what they're saying. Now, as someone who speaks for a living, I understand this very well, that the more you talk, especially on something that you're very, very familiar with, um, we have a tendency of speaking in language that we fully understand, but not everyone does. Um, uh, an example that comes to my mind, I was just down at a church a couple of days ago and, uh, we were, uh, I was, uh, helping them do some tech, uh, technology upgrades, um, you know, digital screens and things like that and, and, you know, moving things into a new, new category. And normally when I do this, I, I'm there with people who are, are, are familiar enough where, where things, where you're using, you know, really, really common, common terms uh, and explaining things in sort of long form, um, you know, because, because they just don't understand, you know, some of the acronyms and some of the, just some of the geek speak. Uh, but one of the guys that was down there was a, a radio engineer um, for a, for a studio down in the Oswego area, 
And we're talking, and all of a sudden I realize I can I can use shorthand uh, with, with him. And as I'm talking, I'm watching the other guys in the uh, in the conversation just kind of check out because you know we're we're speaking in shorthand basically. It's it's when we talk when we speak for a living, it's very very easy for us to use terms that are extremely common for us, but they're not clear to other people. So what ends up happening is people fill in the blanks with their own assumptions of what they think we may have meant. And that sometimes that's fine uh, because they actually get, get in the right direction uh, because maybe they know you. Um, but uh, but most of the time, in my experience, that is not what happens. They fill in the blanks with sort of the worst case scenario. Well, obviously, this is what they meant. Um, and that's not actually what happens. So we got to be really careful with with how we do these things. And if we find ourselves in a position where we don't necessarily agree with someone um, uh, and, and we are accidentally filling in the blanks with our own assumptions, we have some work to do. We, we have to... Um, we have to not just assume that they're in this category and therefore they're heretics and, and everything is bad. No, we, we need to ask some questions. Maybe you need to meet with that person afterwards and go, I'm just curious, when you said this, what exactly did you mean? That's a, such a great question. But we don't do that because we think, well, that would be rude. Well, which is ruder? Um, ruder? Which is, which is more rude? Asking that person to clarify something that you didn't actually understand fully to begin with or Assuming that they meant something that probably they didn't mean, um, I would say the second half of that is that is where where the rudeness actually comes in. It's it's more rude to just remain ignorant than it is to actually just ask ask the question. So we, like I said, we we have work to do. So there are two parts to this work. When we look at the 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 nature of the conversation that we're going to be uh, uh, dealing with, when we find our views challenged, is uh, there's a part of it that's directed towards that person. And then there's a part of it that's directed towards ourselves. And so when we're thinking about the, when our views are challenged, when we direct the, the issue to that work to that person, the question comes up, does this issue make or break the relationship? Are they so far out in left field that I cannot actually fellowship with this person? I, I can't, I, you know, we just can't do it. Um, and the other part is directed towards us. And that, that part is, um, do we know all that we think we know? And so if we're going to be challenged in these areas, we need to ask ourselves this question. Is this challenge, is this person bringing something that is so radically different that I can't get on board with this at all? And do I know enough about the issue that we're talking about to actually disagree? Um, or do I have some work that I need to be doing? So one is towards them, the other is towards us. And so the, the reality is that not all of us, you know, we, uh, if we're going to be honest, um, uh, we usually don't know all that we think we know. And when we find ourselves in this situation, we, we got to ask, you know, do we stomp our feet, pick up our toys and go home? Um, or do we stop and maybe give God a chance to grow us and teach us through this? See, because even if, if you walk through this process that we're about to talk about, you walk through this process, even if you end up still disagreeing with that person, and I mean adamantly, maybe your disagreement actually gets gets deeper, you've still grown in your maturity as a believer because you've done the work. Um, you haven't, you've decided not to take the easy path. You've done the hard thing. Okay, great. So you've, you've moved in a better direction. So Allow God to use that situation and grow you and strengthen you. Just do the work. Don't just, don't just skip off and try to make it, uh, do it, do it the easy way. So, um, as we're going through this, uh, you know, when we, we think about this, the, the first part is the, the toward them aspect. So when we're, when we're dealing with the challenge, so we're gonna, gonna put this stuff towards them. And is this enough to make or break the relationship? Now, think about this. I've uh, I've been a Christian for uh, a little over thirty years now, and um, my entire Christian experience, I have known people over the years, and for a while, I was one of these people where I would not work, or they would they're not willing to work with those churches because they believe certain things. And of course, I'll throw these graphics up here as we're as we're moving along. And so some of the reasons I've been given over the years as to why people couldn't work with such and such church are these. Um, one is they allow women to wear their hair uncovered. <laughs> you know, there's also uh, people who won't work with churches because they ask their women to wear head coverings. So these, these are these are just so funny. 
um, you know, because like that's the end all of of, of the argument. Nope, sorry, women's uh, your women's hair is uncovered, or the women are wearing head coverings. Therefore, you know, I I can't work with you because you know you're, obviously you're not really a Christian. Um, how about this one? The worship team has drums. <laughs> Uh, yep, yep, because that was, um, that's, that's the mark of the beast right there, the drums. Um, you know, they don't use hymnals. Uh, this, this church doesn't use hymnals. I can't work with them. That church does use hymnals. I can't work with them. They're too old fashioned. Uh, they don't believe that you have to speak in tongues to be saved. That's probably my favorite one. If there was any, a, a more useless reason to not work with other Christians about bringing people to the Lord, there, there it is. Uh, how about this one? They use the wrong version of the Bible. And, and more importantly, it's, it's, they don't use the King James version of the Bible. Uh, interesting. Because obviously that's the version of the Bible that Jesus used, right? Um, yeah, how about this one? Their pastor doesn't dress up appropriately, meaning he doesn't wear a suit and tie every Sunday. Because obviously Jesus wore suits and ties. Um, oh wait, they weren't invented. Uh, yeah, so that didn't happen there. Um, how about this one? Um, they don't believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. Or the other side of that, they do believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. It's just, it's just silly the way, the way it works. Um, and now, and all of these, all of these things in this little list here, as a pastor, I have been accused of all of them. Uh, this is why that, yeah, this is why your church isn't going in the right direction. Like all of these. My favorite are the last two, because at some point someone believed that I didn't believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today, which I do. We'll get into that here in a minute. Another part, people, uh, get, get mad because I do believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. Like, Really, like that was the that was the end all of the conversation. I, I can't I can't work with you because because you think um, you know uh, 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 you think that if if you're, you're praying for someone for a healing, you think that it's a possibility that they can be healed. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous how how this stuff works. Um, at one point in time, I remember being told by someone who referred to themselves as an apostle. Um, uh, that I was a, a bad pastor because I didn't teach people how to speak in tongues or perform miracles, uh, which is great, uh, especially because that person um, was also uh, wearing glasses and hearing and a hearing aid. So, at, at what point in time does you know the phrase "physician heal thyself" uh, come into play? So, if if you know, hey, you know what, there are sick people in your church, and that's a sign of a of a church that, that doesn't have a you know a, a spirit filled pastor. Like, are, are you serious? Like, this guy is saying this while wearing hearing aids uh, and and glasses. I mean, so 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 which is it? You know, do you have to be in perfect health in order to be a uh, a Christian, or can you know can life is life allowed to happen? Is God allowed to decide whether or not someone is healed or not? Obviously, he is because that guy is still wearing hearing aids. So, um, it's just it's just funny the way it works out. But we put these standards on other people that we think are the most important things. And uh, it's it's sad. It's just really sad. And just to be really clear, none of the reasons that I listed right there are valid when it comes to cutting ties with other believers. If that is a reason why you can't work with people from such and such church, then you really need to evaluate yourself because what you're doing is you are putting yourself in the position of God and you are judging them unworthy to partake in the ministry of the gospel because they do not align with all of your, uh, all of your, your, your personal beliefs. And you are making your personal beliefs the proof of salvation. They're not real Christians unless they are like you. And that's a sad, sad place to be. It's also a dangerous place to be because scripture tells us that when we judge people like that, we are judged in that same way. I want to err on the side of grace. And there were plenty of times over my life as a, especially a young believer that I had those views. And then thankfully I worked my way out of them very quickly. Now there are some places I absolutely draw the line. Um, but that's, those are few and far between as they should be. Um, so when it comes down to it, there are two questions that actually matter in the life, uh, in the life of believers. And it comes down to this. Do you believe that we are saved by grace through faith in the works of Christ on the cross? There's the first question. The second question is, do you believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God? And, and those two questions cannot be separated, right? You can't, you, you can't release one from the other. So you got people online that, that say things like, like Andy Stanley is really good, good about this. I want to believe in Jesus, but, but we don't need the Old Testament. I want to believe in Jesus, but I don't need the Old Testament. Without the Old Testament, you don't know who Jesus is. You don't know what he came to do. You don't, you don't know anything about the character and nature and standards and, 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 uh, a moral, uh, a moral application of God's law. You have nothing. 
what he wants, he wants the idea of salvation. He wants the idea of forgiveness. He wants the idea of universal acceptance of all things because God is good. But he forgets that without Christ, there is no object of our faith. But without scripture, there is no understanding of our faith. So without scripture, if you're going to toss out any of the Bible, any of it, then you, you run into a very serious problem where you are no longer following the God of scripture. You are no longer following the real Jesus, the real father. You're not following the real standards of God's law. You are following a God of your own making. You are following a, a Jesus of your own mind. And what you will find is that Jesus is going to agree with everything you want, everything you say. You will never be out of step with God because, hey, he agrees with you, right? That's not how this works. But if we can agree on those two things, that we are saved by grace through faith in the works of Christ on the cross, and that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, meaning it contains no mistakes. It contains no mistakes. If it says something that goes against our modern day social acceptance, then it's not the Bible that is out of step. It is our modern day social acceptance that is out of step. And we agree to follow the scriptures and its teachings, and we also agree to not follow whatever society happens to be accepting today. That's not the way this works. The Bible is the universal standard for all things, not man's thinking. So um, now if someone answers yes to those two questions, this process is very simple. You, you, there's no reason to, to not work with them. Now, you can have some very interesting conversations. You can agree to disagree, but that's fine. As long as you both understand, look, their views lead them in this direction. My views lead me in this direction. Okay, that's fine. I'm not going to question their salvation or their value in the ministry of the gospel. I have a different view. They have a different view. Let's let's move forward with the gospel of grace. But if you don't have the gospel of grace, now there's an issue. Now there's a place where we have to we we have to decide what we're really endorsing here. But like I said, these things are few and far between. Um, now, if someone does not answer yes to those two questions, they, they want to believe in Jesus, but they don't want to believe in the Bible. Hmm. Or they want to believe in the Bible, but they don't necessarily want to put their faith in Jesus. These are both problems. But they're not insurmountable problems. You just have to come to a very simple conclu- conclusion. You should relate to those people the exact same way you would relate to any other unbeliever because that is what they are. They are unbelievers. They are not regenerate. They have not been converted. They, they have, their faith is not in the right place. They may want to believe in, in, in God and an afterlife and eternity and they may want to believe in forgiveness, but they don't want what God has for them. They don't want what scripture brings to the table. They want a God of their own design. That is an unbeliever. And we relate to them just like we would any other unbeliever. We try to bring them to the reality of Christ. We try to bring them to the place where they meet the real Jesus, the Jesus that changes hearts, the Jesus that renews the spirit within, that brings, that breathes new life into us. That's the Jesus that we're trying to get them to under, to understand, the Jesus of the Bible, the God of scripture. But we need to be able to move forward with those who do believe in salvation by grace through faith that that do align with us on the areas that make that that are the most important we need to be able to walk forward with them and this is not a new concept look at look at what paul says in romans 12:16 through 18 he says live in harmony with one another do not be haughty but associate <coughs> excuse me but associate with the lowly never be wise in your own sight and repay no one evil for evil <clears throat> Excuse me, but give thought to what ha- uh, what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible. So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So do everything you can to live in peace with other peoples, and sometimes that means understanding that they have a view that you don't, and that is okay. They do not need to agree with you on all things. We just need to align on the on the things that matter: salvation the supremacy of Christ, the inerrancy of Scripture. If you want a a really simple list, go look at the uh, five solas. 
and I'm not going to tell you what they are because uh, you need to go look them up. So there. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so that's towards them. What are we? That's that's when we're challenged. This is this is our duty to them to be able to look in this direction. Now, what about turning the tables and um, uh, moving it to us? So, what do we do? Uh, let's let's turn the magnifying glass uh, at ourselves here. Um, the first question is really simple: Do you know all that you think you know? Uh, or another way of saying it is, do you understand the issue well enough to hold the opinion that you hold? Some of us have opinions about things, um, but honestly, we don't deserve to have the opinion that we have on those things because we haven't actually done the work. That's another swig of coffee, and it was delicious, by the way. Um, my favorite coffee, Stewart Shop Hazelnut Coffee. I, I don't know why. It's just it's just really good. Um, I get a big double every morning, uh, and that's usually why I, you know, by 11 o'clock, my teeth are chattering because the caffeine is just so amazing. Um, so anyway, moving right along. Do we understand the issue well enough to hold the opinion that we hold? Sometimes we have an opinion about something just because that is the opinion that we grew up with. That is the opinion of the denomination that we happen to be attending, and that is not right. When I was uh, young, in, uh, uh, young in ministry, I was working with a, a group out of, uh, I was working with a, a youth ministry out of Clayton called Gen Next, and we had gone to this, and this is, uh, based out of a Baptist church, and we had gone to this, uh, uh, like statewide Baptist convention, and we were gonna promote the ministry down there, cause we, we would travel and do youth events in different places. And when we got down there, it was kind of a setup where it was me and another guy, and I was initially presenting, um, and he was gonna be a heckler in the crowd. And the idea was I was going to be bringing these these ideas of what our youth ministry is, and he was going to be asking uh, questions like, shouldn't we be teaching them what it means to be Baptist? Shouldn't we, you know, the, the whole idea was to push back against anything that wasn't wasn't you know of that denomination and you know it was it was it was fun it, it caused it was it was it was interesting enough it caused some you know a little, little friction down there but it was it was agreed upon friction so it worked out really well um and so <clears throat> the idea was whether or not the people in the uh in that particular meeting were going to agree with him you know yes we should be focused on what it means to be baptist um but what i was bringing was the idea was we need to bring we need to bring uh, kids to to repentance and so this this back and forth happened and just like we had planned almost too well um the people that were there were 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 very easily agreeing yes it's more important that we teach these kids what it means to be baptist and you know i get it every denomination has this view there's the reason that there are denominations because is because different groups believe that they have it right and they're more right than the other group um because if if that's not the view that we had then we would all we would all belong to you know to to one church uh but that's not the way it works around the world in case you're not familiar with this there are over 33,000 Protestant denominations and these are registered denominations and the reason there are is because we don't get along with one another and we divide over the most ridiculous things you use the wrong version of this particular hymnal i don't like the way you sing this song um you know we we you have drums we and we don't you know you have an electric guitar should only be an acoustic there's so many reasons that why we why we split up it's it's ridiculous you know i think that the most ridiculous one i've ever heard and i actually knew this church the church split because the, uh, at one point during a baptism the pastor was was baptizing in the name of jesus and other people wanted to, to only only baptize in the name of the father son and the holy spirit like that that was the choice <laughs> that brought division within the church and the church could no longer fellowship with one another. They had to split. What a useless mindset that is. Talk about a ridiculous way of causing division. I can imagine God just looking down on that thinking, what, what, what happened here? You know, what, 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 what is, what, what do they think they're gaining in this situation? It's just, it's just ridiculous. But when we find ourselves in those situations, we have to ask the question, do we actually understand this issue well enough to have the position that we hold? Do we know? Do we, do we really understand this? So let's look at a, I'm going to look at a couple of things that came up last week. One thing specifically that brought up a lot of conversation was in session number two, Andrew Rappaport had uh, basically said this, that God does not speak outside of the Bible. Now, I understood what he meant and I understood where he was coming from. 
because I know uh, I know enough about Andrew, and I know enough about where um, his uh, his theological views, where I understood where he where he he came from, and it didn't bother me one tiny bit. But I know the bunch of people had it's almost a visceral reaction. It's like whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, as soon as he said it, I was like, ah, okay, here we go. Um, <clears throat> You know, and then he recommended a book, um, titled God Doesn't Whisper. Um, but if you go to, I think it's, um, I think it's 2 Kings 19, um, where it actually says, uh, you know, uh, God wasn't in the thunder and God wasn't in the, in the fire. Um, but God whispered. Uh, so, you know, uh, God actually does whisper. But that's not what, it's, 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 it's not what he meant. Uh, it was, uh, we were filling, you know, people, we fill in the blanks with, with different views. I knew enough about him and I actually have these books. So I understand what he was, what he was saying. But the problem was he didn't actually clarify the, the position. So it, it led to some very interesting conversations. So I want to examine that statement. God does not speak outside of the Bible. Now I can't, I can't count the number of times that I have been praying, you know, walking, reading, um, you know, serving, doing something. And, uh, and I know without hesitation, that God was showing me, uh, showing me something. He was leading me in some way. He was teaching me some things. Or in simple terms, God spoke to me about X, Y, Z, you know, whatever was going on at that particular time. I know without hesitation that God was speaking to me in, in, in those moments. So when I hear something like God doesn't speak outside the Bible, what do you think my, my reaction was? Where was I in that little scale? Did I completely agree? Did I somewhat disagree? Or did I completely disagree? Now, you might be thinking, you obviously completely disagree. Uh, and that would be not accurate. I somewhat disagree. So, uh, you know, and you might be, you know, Pastor, you just, you just said you've heard from God on multiple occasions. You're right, I have. And, and let's get to what this actually means. Um, so we need to define a couple of things here first. We need to understand what a cessationist is, and we need to understand what a continuationist is, because these two views, now down the road, we're going to be getting into the uh, book of Acts. I think about the second, uh, first or second week in June, we'll be getting into the book of Acts, and how you fall in this these two categories is going to determine how you approach that book and how you end up interpreting that book. So the, so it's really important to understand this. Now I'm not going to get into this in great detail. I'm just going to give you some of the, some of the highlights of what these positions are and then we'll move on to that particular statement. Because I don't, I actually don't disagree with the statement. Where I disagree with them is in the application of it. And so we'll get to that in just a second. So a cessationist would believe that the, what they call, and it's important to understand this, is what they call the sign gifts, the, the, these, this, this determination of the sign gifts or the sign positions or sign offices, they're not called that in scripture. These are, these are delineations that have been given to these particular gifts and, and offices over the years by people like Augustine and, you know, about, you know, just some of the early church fathers. And that's where this basic movement came from. And so what they would say is that the sign gifts, like healing and prophecy, as well as the, the offices that would, like, uh, apostle and prophet, are no longer in use today, okay? Now, the, the easiest way to understand this is that, um, that these particular giftings, these particular offices were for the establishment of the church. So these were given to the church in the first century so that the church would become established. Um, and so the signs and wonders and miracles, these were to, to firmly plant the Christian church in the, in, in the world. And, now that that is uh, has already been done, they're no longer necessary. So after the apostles, uh, uh, the the twelve died died off, all of these things dissipated. They ceased. Okay, so just easy. It's a bit more complicated than that, but you get the idea. That's that's the the the, the fundamentals of it. Um, but here's the thing: not all cessationists do agree on the particulars. They don't all agree on, you know, how far to take this. There's some groups within the cessationist camp that would say that not only are there no more people who have the gift of healing today, uh, God doesn't heal today. I've had these conversations. Um, but there are other people who say, well, no, God still heals. He just doesn't, uh, we just don't have people in the church who are healers, right? Where I would agree there never was. And I think every time someone was healed throughout scripture, it was because they were being led by the spirit, but that's another conversation. So, um, 
Now, the other side of that is the continuation to, uh, continuationist side. Um, and what basically the continuationist side, which is the side that I find myself on, would say that the gifts and the positions or the offices are still in place today, just as they were in the first century. Uh, and I would even say just as they have been for all time. When I read that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, I don't see a difference in the way God has, has utilized his spirit and the, and the hands of men throughout history. But that's, like I said, that's another conversation that take way too long to get into. Um, <clears throat> but now, just like the, the cessationist side of things, on the continuationist side, we don't agree on the particulars either. There are some that are, are very much on the conservative side of things where the, it's we pray and the Holy Spirit leads. And then if the Holy Spirit acts, it's because the, it's because the Holy Spirit is acting in accordance to the will of God. So when we lay hands on someone and they're, uh, and, uh, for, uh, for a healing or, uh, you know, a, a word or whatever, that is because the Spirit is acting in accordance to the will of God and God said yes. What, however that works. Then that's the conservative side of things. But now you go over to one side to uh, the, uh, I, I will just say the not so conservative side. Um, I, and I would even refer to them as the wackadoodle side, uh, where it's just that it's no longer the Holy Spirit acting in accordance to the will of God. It's the Holy Spirit acting according to the will of the person praying. So, you have people like, like, like Todd Bentley and Benny Hinn and, um, uh, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these, you know, NAR guys, Bill Johnson, we'll get into that here in a, in a, in a minute, that have the view that we should have the same authority on earth that Jesus had because we have the same spirit in us that he had in, in him. Uh, and they have this idea that because when they say, when Jesus laid aside his divinity, that he was not God on earth, he was just a man in right standing with God. That's their view. It's called kenosis. It's a, it's a heresy. It's, it's a horrible theological view. Um, but, uh, well, you know, like I said, we'll get into that another time when we get into the book of Acts because it's important that we understand how far off this is. Um, but they believe that when they speak, the Holy Spirit acts. So they have control over these spiritual powers where the conservative side of the continuationist movement would say, no, we act in accordance to the will of God. If he says go, we go. If he says stay, we stay. If he says stop, we stop. However this works. So there's this huge divide between these two sides of this, of this camp, just as there is in the, on the cessationist side. You see, it's not safe over there and bad over here. Both side has, both sides of this conversation has their messy side of their view. Um, because they, you know, just like any other group of people, you get enough people together, they don't all agree on all the particulars. So we need to understand that. But the root of it is one side believes that the gifts and the offices no longer are in, in, uh, work today. Uh, they ceased. And the other side says, no, they, they are still very much in, in practice today. And so a really easy application of this would be this. John MacArthur w- is a firm cessationist without n- no apology of cessationist. And, uh, you know what? I, I appreciate most of his teachings. I disagree with a lot of what he says. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not, you know, um, but, but, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to him, you know, the, the interpretation of, of, of the way he, he treats scripture, I don't have any problem with him. I've, I've listened to multi, uh, much of his teachings, and because I understand his views on cessationism and Calvinism, I can filter that stuff out, and I can take, I can take the good part and add it to, to my own understanding. It works out pretty well. But he would say that there are no longer apostles today. They, they don't exist. They've ceased. Whereas I would say, when you see the amount of influence he has over the global church, I would say that that proves that he is an apostle. So you see the difference. He believes that that position has ceased. I would say that he is actually occupying that position. Now, you know, it's, it's, it all depends on how you're going to approach it and which side of this particular fence you fall, you, you fall on. But you, you can get an idea how this can be applied in different ways. Um, so now, in all fairness to the position, the cessationist position, I will say this. Um, I don't have any, uh, I don't have any, um, ill will towards people who, who find themselves in the cessationist camp. I know people who have been in the, the, uh, 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 Pentecostal charismatic church for, for years and, you know, even decades. And 
they leave and they end up in a cessationist church. And at first I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that people would do that. And then, then you realize that, no, I get it. I understand completely why they would do that because it's a very safe place to be. If you want the, the view of, of scripture and the supernatural, if you wanted the safest place to be where you weren't going to be challenged and you weren't going to have to deal with whack jobs, the cessationist camp is, is the safest place to be. It, it really is. I think it's unfortunate. I think you cut yourself off from something beautiful, but it is a very safe place to be. And I get it. You know, look, no, no ill will, uh, um, uh, from my side. Uh, but I, I think you've cut yourself off from something, you know, pretty, pretty amazing. Now, on our side of the fence, well, I will say it like this. When you look at both of those arguments, it's pretty easy that the, the lines are not as black and white as, as some people claim that they are. Um, but when you look at this particular argument, when you understand the two views, when you look at this particular statement, God does not speak outside of his word. It doesn't, just because I disagree with the cessationist application does not mean that I disagree with the statement. So uh, I actually believe that the statement is true. So let me, uh, but I need to explain that, right? So now that we under, have an understanding of what these two views are, um, I would say this. I believe without apology that God speaks to, uh, to us today. And I think he speaks to us in a number of different ways. Um, I also believe that God does not speak outside of his word. Um, meaning that if God speaks something to you, and you firmly believe that it's from God, what is it that you're supposed to do next? Now, if you look at 1 John 4, 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test every spirit to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have, got, have gone out into the world. So there is no way that we just universally have this ability to just, you know, God spoke something to me, and therefore it is universally true for the entire church. No, God is not giving you the ability to write new books of the Bible. That's not happening. Your, anything you believe God is speaking to you is going to, you need to test it. We are, we are scripturally mandated to test it. And the only test that we have, <clears throat> the only measuring stick that we have is the word of God. So if God is revealing something to you, if God is showing something to you, if God is teaching something to you, then you are mandated to do one very simple thing, and that is to test it against the word of God. So when you think about that, even if God is speaking to you, in, in one way, shape, or form, if he's leading you, however you, uh, whatever, whatever it is, I'm not going to get into the voice of God today. It would, it would take too long. If you're doing this in my mind correctly, and you're making sure that whatever you think God is saying to you is lining up with the character and nature of God, with the moral standards of God's word, then here's a, here is a truth. Then God does not speak outside of his word, does he? You see, the difference, whether you're a continuationist or a cessationist, is not the statement, it's the application. So if you're saying that God only speaks through his word, that there is never a voice of God, that's an application. The statement, God does not speak outside of his word, can still be true on either the cessationist or the continuationist side. The difference is how you approach it. But the problem is, and and this is where I have a lot of sympathy for the people on the cessationist side of things, is that in the charismatic side of the church, and now as a charismatic, as someone who is on the Pentecostal side of things, I am very critical of my own movement first. Now, I can find a lot of criticisms in the cessationist side. Um, you know, even churches like John MacArthur's, you know, Grace Church, they've, you, all you have to do is dig a little and you can find dirt on anyone. That includes me. It doesn't take a genius to find something wrong with somebody else's views. That, that's hardly a sign of an evolved set of thinking. But I do understand that if I'm going to be critical of a movement, I need to be critical of mine first. And so on this side of the aisle, it's uh, on the on the continuationist side of the aisle, I completely understand why many in the reformed movement, why many in the cessationist movement have really um, significantly uh, low views of people in this side of the uh, of the church. And and I get it. So uh, I'll, I'll show you a couple of things and, and why, and, uh, and then we'll, then we'll wrap this up. Um, so here's a quote that I've brought up, um, uh, multiple, multiple times. Um, 
that uh, I want you to consider. The quote is this, and this is from one of the top leaders in the charismatic movement today. Okay, and this is not an exaggeration on my part. This person is among the biggest, most revered voices in the charismatic church today. And the quote is this, how can we expect the anointing of the first century church when we value a book they didn't have more than the Holy Spirit they did have? Think about that statement for a second. Now, this particular teacher, they have a school of supernatural ministry. Um, I'll just tell you, it's Bill Johnson from Bethel Church in uh, California. Um, I used to listen to a lot of their stuff, uh, and then I actually began to listen to what he was saying and the direction that they were going. And what I realized was this wasn't just bad theology. This was unbelievably heretical theology being masked as Christianity. And so I began to dig a little bit deeper and actually pay attention. And when I'm reading some of his books, um, I would pay a lot more attention to what it is that they were saying. And I'm going to, I'm going to read you a section of one of his books here in just a minute. But this statement, how can we expect the anointing of the first century church when we value a book they didn't have more than the Holy Spirit they did have? In their school of supernatural ministry, one of the views that they have is called going off the map. And what it, what it is, is you're encouraged to use the Bible as the starting point, but it's not the end all. So the Bible is the introduction, but there's more to it. And uh, if you're thinking, boy, that sounds familiar, it it should sound familiar um, because the first time this particular lie was used, it sounded like this. Did God really say you shouldn't eat from the trees, any of the trees in the garden? So that was the first lie ever told to mankind that it, did, did God really say that, that this is what, what you're supposed to do? And of course the conversation goes on between, between Eve and, 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 the, and this, and the serpent. And, and what ends up happening? He says, no, God is hiding this from you because he knows that if you eat of this, you will be like him. So the temptation is, if you do this, you will be like God. You will grow. And so the idea is, if you go beyond the word of God, if you go past the word of God, if you go deeper than the word of God, and you just listen to the spirit within rather than the word on the page, you will find the real anointing. You have to go off the map to really find who you are. Now, that may sound like I'm making that up. That may may sound like I'm, I'm going too far, like that's not what he's really, you know, that's not what they're really teaching. Um, cause I know there'll be some people that will listen to this on the, to this on the radio and, um, I got news for you. It is exactly what they teach. And here's, here's, here's the proof here. So this is part of, um, a book called When Heaven Invades Earth. Um, it's a practical guide to a life of miracles. And this is a section titled An Ultimate Goal. Okay. So this is from the book, pages 70 and 71. Uh, and it reads like this. Um, there is a difference. Between, um, uh, sorry, yeah, I just picked up my glasses, so I, I can't read uh, a book up close without my, with my glasses on. I gotta take them off. But it says, um, there is a difference between an ultimate, an immediate and ultimate goals. Success with an immediate goal makes it possible to reach the ultimate goal. But failure in the immediate prevents us from reaching our final goal. And he says, bowlers know this. Each lane not only has 10 pins at the far end, but it also has markers in the lane itself. A good bowler knows how his or her ball rotates and, um, as it is released in the hand. Bowlers will aim at a marker in the lane as an initial target, yet they receive no points for hitting it. Points are only given when the ultimate target is hit, the pins at the end of the lane. Interesting. But then he goes on to add this. Likewise, salvation was not the ultimate goal of Christ's coming. No, you did not hear that wrong. That is exactly what the book says. Likewise, salvation was not the ultimate goal of Christ's coming. It was the immediate target, the marker in the lane. Without accomplishing redemption, there was no hope for the ultimate goal, which was to fill each born-again person with the Holy Spirit. Wow. So Christ, according to Bill Johnson, Christ's work on the cross, his ultimate sacrifice his payment for the sin of mankind was only a marker in the lane for which he received no points. I'm not exactly sure what the point scale is in that, but you, you get the idea. Not only is this horrible theology, it's also factually wrong, as they did have most of the scriptures in the first century. In Second Peter 3.15-16, um, 
It says this, and count, uh, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all of his letters when he speaks, uh, in them of these matters. These are some things, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, and this is the last part, as they do the other scriptures. See that first quote, valuing a book they didn't have? Uh, they did have it. The bulk of the first century, uh, what we would call the New Testament, was available to the first century church within about the first 30 or 40 years. A lot of that writing, when it came out, it dispersed to the churches as it was written very, very quickly. So when I hear things like this coming from people who claim to believe the same as me, I understand completely why a cessationist would take their position because it's by far the safest place. You never have to worry about nut jobs like Bill Johnson who are going to twist the Bible to come up with their own version of, of some sort of, some sort of theology that has nothing to do with, with Christ or salvation. It's all some, some weird form of mystic heresy. But I also know that to hide myself from the voice of God is to hide myself from something wonderful and I'm not willing to do that. But in order for me to live in peace with those who hold other views and not be upset or threatened by those views, I first have to make sure I understand my own view and be willing to acknowledge the, acknowledge the, issue, the issues associated with it. So we have to turn in first. So when I'm challenged by someone else's thinking, I'm going to evaluate their thinking. I'm going to evaluate what I hear coming from them. But I'm also going to first and foremost evaluate my own thinking. Because I have to know what I, I have to make sure I know what, I, what I'm claiming to know first. And then I can make an informed decision on whether or not I'm going to be working or in a, be in agreement with someone. So when I'm challenged by a different view, it's not going to knock me off my game. It's not, it's, it's, it just challenges me to know, to know what I know better. So no matter where we find ourselves, either in agreement or not, let's make sure we don't let a difference of opinion knock us off our game. Ask the right questions, do the work, and be willing to help those who are, who are wrong find the truth. As scripture says, those who are wise help those, you know, help those who have gone astray, bring them back. You know, at the very least, at the very least, when we do this, we end up stronger, kinder, and more knowledgeable as a believer than when we started. And I can't see that as a bad thing. All right. Well, there you go. I hope that was, uh, I uh, hope that was informative for you. I hope that uh, uh, gives you something to think about, something to chew on. Um, feel free to uh, send me an email or a comment on my uh, uh, Facebook or YouTube page. And uh, yeah, have a fantastic day. Lord bless you. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>